How are we? You guys doing all right tonight? Everybody all right? All right, all right. Here's the thing. I saw Top Gun. I was already planning on a camp stash. And then I saw Top Gun. I'm not going to give any spoilers because it was a fantastic, fantastic movie. Um, How many of you guys saw Top Gun Maverick already? Beautiful movie. Beautiful mustache in that movie. Uh, This is going to be fun. Um, I'm preaching down here because we we actually took this front row out of the auditorium. Uh, We said, we don't need that because we're going to fill this space during worship. And uh, not that uh, worship isn't the main event, but it's definitely the main event tonight. And we're going to give that all of our attention, all of our focus. But tonight, all of us are worship leaders. Somebody say amen. Amen. All of us are worship leaders. I only heard it from this section. Does this, is this team okay with leading worship over on this side of the room? Okay, good, good. All of us are worship leaders tonight, and uh, we're recording the very first ever live recording at Collective with the first four original songs from Movement Youth Music. And we're going to have some live elements, some studio elements, and it's going to be completely different than anything else we've ever heard from Clint and Joseph and the gang. Uh, but naturally, we thought, hey, before we worship, we should probably talk about worship. You guys okay with that? Say amen if you're okay with that. We're going to talk about it. We're going to read a little bit of God's Word. I'm going to have a little bit of an abbreviated message because we, we saved some extra time for worship. But worship is personal. Worship is incredibly personal. It's special. It is unique. And, and some people might even say that it's an intimate experience. So when we start talking about what is right worship and what is wrong worship, what is biblical worship, what is non-biblical worship, uh, people get defensive. Have you guys ever seen that before? They get defensive. Sometimes I get defensive. Like, don't say that about Chris Tomlin. Or don't say that about Maverick City Music, okay? Like, you better, like, ease off. And then some people will say, well, I have a question about some of their lyrics. And so we get, we get into fights. Entire denominations are sometimes defined by their worship. Some denominations say, hey, we don't, we don't use instruments. That's not our thing. Some denominations say, we use some instruments, but we don't use drums. Drums are of the devil. And uh, we don't believe that, as you can see by the, the drum kit behind me. Some people only sing hymns, Right? And you got somebody at the front of the room saying, you know, just as I am. That's that's the kind of church I grew up in. I'm familiar with that. And so there's not, I won't say that there's a right or wrong, you know, style of worship. But I just want to kind of prod everybody and say, hey, this might get personal. It might step on some people's toes. Um, And I think because it's personal, because we, we get defensive about it, that's maybe part of the reason that we don't talk about it as often as we should right? I think we need to talk about it, and we're going to do that. So go to Malachi chapter 1. Malachi chapter 1. Um, I, I say this a lot. I'm not trying to, to hurt feelings. I'm not trying to step on people's toes, but I'm going to read the Bible, and the Bible is going to step on some of your toes tonight, okay? That is just inevitable. It's going to step on my toes, and that's all right. In verse 1, it says, this is a prophecy. It's a prophecy, a word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Malachi was a prophet delivering this word from God to the people of Israel. And the NIV, I'm reading now the NIV, it translates this word of the Lord to Israel, but the original Hebrew word that was used here, it was a burden. This was a heavy, maybe even a threatening word from God to his children, to the people of Israel. And so this is not like a Hey, just seeing how everybody's doing. Hey, how's your Wednesday evening? You know, this is not just like a, hey, just stopping by to say hello kind of message. This is a heavy, burdensome, threatening message. He says, I've loved you. I've loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I've loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I've turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, that's Esau's nation, Edom may say, though we've been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish it. They will be called the wicked land, a people under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord, even beyond the borders of, of Israel. And so this is a tense letter. How many of you guys have ever been over at a friend's house and they start getting in trouble with their parents and it gets awkward real quick? 
And it's more awkward when you're like tight with their family. And so they're like not hiding anything. They're not like, I need to speak with you. They're like, Clint, what, what's that in the middle of the room? You were supposed to clean up your room. That was my experience growing up as a friend of Clint's. And the same thing happened in my house, right? Our parents didn't hide any of the drama. They didn't pretend because they're like, you're practically one of my kids anyways. That's a little bit what it's like for us as the reader here in Malachi chapter 1. Because God is about to lay into the people of Israel. And, and we're just like, ooh, this is awkward. This is really, really awkward. And so he goes on to say, listen, um, I've loved you, right? And they're like, uh, yeah, I've taken care of you, haven't I? Yeah. This is like when you're at a friend's house and your parent, their parent comes up and they're like, Clint, do you like living in this house? Do you enjoy eating our food? And I'm like, I can leave. No, you're fine. I want to witness, right? <laughs> That's kind of what's happening here. And the Israelites, the Israelites are like, God, you don't even love us. And he says, you want to know who I don't love? Esau is somebody that I don't love. I love your forefather, uh, Jacob, but I did not love your forefather, his brother, Esau. Your neighbors, the Edomites, that place is a dump. You guys know some people, who, their house is kind of like a dump? It's, it's a little messy. My car is a dump. I, I never clean my car. He said, that place is a dump. If you want to go live with them, that's fine. But don't pretend like you're oppressed because you're loved. I'll show you oppressed. You can go live with them. That, that's perfectly fine if you want to do that. And that's true. God had blessed them. God had taken care of them. He'd loved them. He'd delivered them. He'd given them the promised land. He'd been doing that for about a thousand years. And God had been faithful to his people. And they're like, God, it doesn't seem like you love us. But if we're honest, I think a lot of times we do the exact same kind of thing. God has been faithful to us. He's taken care of us. He's delivered us. He's been good to us. And we say, God, it seems like everything's not going exactly my way. And then we start getting a bad attitude, and that affects our worship. There's a problem when we forget how good God has been to us. Verse 6 says this. This is God speaking still. He says, a son honors his father and a slave his master. Well, if I'm the father, where is the honor due me? If I'm the master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? It is you, priest, who show contempt for my name. That's another word for displeasure or distaste or even hatred. You're disrespecting my name. But you ask, well, how have we shown contempt to your name? I'll tell you how. By offering defiled food on my offer, on my altar. But you ask, well, how have we defiled you? You've done, you defiled me by saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. Here's what's happening. Verse 8, when you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you offer, when you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering that to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? And so we've walked into this tense moment. It's uncomfortable. God's angry. Now we know why he's angry. He's angry because his children, the chosen nation, the people of Israel, have disrespected him and dishonored him. They've disrespected him by offering false uh, or, 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 or lousy offerings. And this was part of the religious system for the Jewish people. They were supposed to, especially on one day, offer as an atonement for the people this huge, like monumental, special sacrifice to symbolically cover the sins of the people. And they're doing a lousy job of it. They were getting diseased, lame animals that no one else wanted, animals that they couldn't sell at the market. Like these were their leftovers. These were their scraps. This was, a, this was careless worship. And so... Um, it was very, very clear. They were supposed to ver give their very best, and they weren't. And so you might think, wow, this is like a cool like, history lesson, Zach, sacrifices, and you, know, you, know, you might read about the Day of Atonement or things like that in other parts of the Jewish religious system. But this wasn't just a weird religious ritual. This was their worship. Say amen if you get where I'm going here. This was their worship. And you might think that rituals are just an Old Testament thing, and we don't do that anymore. Like, we're modern, sophisticated Christians, and all we need is God's love. Well, what then is the Lord's Supper? What is baptism? Those are rituals. Those are just modern-day uh, rituals of the, the church, of the church age. Um, when we gather up here every single week in the same place at the same time, and we sing three songs, and then we have a message, that's a ritual of sorts. That's liturgy, if nothing else. And so, uh, 
rituals are part of worship, and God is here saying, listen, guys, Israel, your worship sucks. Your worship is trash. It's garbage. You should be embarrassed by your worship. He says, listen, when you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, isn't that wrong? Try offering that to your governor. See how that works out. Try offering that to even a family member. They'd be like, this is kind of gross. Is this the best you could do? If you guys had somebody famous, like let's say the president or the governor or somebody like that, maybe a famous actor came to your house, your house, what would you feed them? Shout it out. What? Fried chicken? Fish? Mac and cheese? Chick-fil-A? How many of you guys, by round of applause, round of applause, you're going to cater that dinner? Round of applause? Okay, how many of you guys, you're going to cook your own meal? Okay, about half the room. Uh, my wife, Janae, she makes amazing, amazing big ziti. It's the most delicious thing in the world. It's better than your mom's. It's better than your grandma's. I'm telling you, I, know, I said what I said. I'm not trying to start a fight. I shouldn't have said that. But it's really, really good. And I know for a fact that if somebody famous or somebody, you know, that we should esteem came to my house, and be like, baby, you got to cook. you got to cook the big ziti. It's, it, you got to pull out roll out the red carpet. I'm going to clean the house. I'm going to get everything ready. And, you know, on the other side of that, what we don't want to do is have me cook for the governor. We don't want to have Zach cook for the president because Zach knows how to make spaghetti and PB&J. And that's about it. And I'm, I make a mean peanut butter and jelly with Peter Pan crunchy peanut butter. Yes, you're, it's fine, it's fine. You're allowed to be wrong. It's fine. And then strawberry preserves. Strawberry preserves. I don't want that jelly just falling off my sandwich. Anyways, they were giving God the PB&J. And if you love PB&J, then that's a terrible analogy. But they were giving God what took the least effort, what cost them the least. It was disrespectful, and they should be embarrassed. And so this was careless worship, and God goes on to make very, very clear that careless worship is even worse than no worship at all. Careless worship is even worse than no worship at all. Look at verse 9. Now plead with God to be gracious to us. With such offerings from your hands, will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? You guys think that God accepts garbage worship? Don't miss this. Oh, that this, this is God speaking. Oh, that one of you would shut the doors to the temple so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I'm not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to me because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. This is troubling, and, and, and you're probably a little uncomfortable for the Israelites, for the priests, for the people who's, who are getting cussed out right here in Malachi chapter 1, but in a roundabout way, you should be a little bit uncomfortable yourself because we don't live in Jerusalem, we don't live in this time period, and we don't live under the Jewish religious system, but we still offer worship to God, and what God has revealed to us is that there is a standard for worship. We don't get to just come in here and give whatever we've got that day, whatever is convenient, whatever doesn't cost us anything, whatever doesn't embarrass us, whatever makes us feel comfortable. That's not what God says about himself. And you're kind of crazy if you're like, well, I think God says, what does God say about himself? That's a made-up God. If you're like, well, I think God is fine with, he didn't say he's fine with it. You get what I'm saying? And this is, this is why it's troubling. Because he says, it would be better if you shut the doors to the temple altogether. It'd be better if you didn't even come to church. If you're going to bring that weak worship, which is the title of this mini message of sorts, if you're going to bring that weak worship in here, that's insulting. And God says it'd be better if you didn't come to church. It'd be better. And here's the thing. I, need, I do need to camp out here for one second. We are short on time. Um, this is primarily a talk for people who are followers of Jesus. If you're here tonight and you're not a Christian, you're like, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? What kind of crazy peanut butter and jelly cult is this? Um, crunch, the crunchy kind. No, seriously, this is, this is primarily for followers of Jesus, okay? 
This is primarily for followers of Jesus. If you're not a Christian, I don't expect you, and God does not expect you to know how to properly worship him with your heart and mind and soul, okay? And so uh, don't be a little uncomfortable. Like, Zach, I accepted Jesus like five seconds ago. I'm still trying to figure this out. There's grace. There's grace. Uh, But a lot of us know better, or we should know better. And so verse 11, he says, my name will be great among the nations. God says, I will be worshiped across the world with or without you. That is also troubling because what that means is is God is is kind of foretelling a couple of things here. He's kind of foretelling, foreshadowing, hinting or warning here about what's about to happen because at the end of this book, at the end of the book of Malachi, God doesn't speak to his people for 400 years. That's how seriously he takes worship. He says, "You, you have insulted me. In the worst way possible, I can't even speak to you. I can't even interact with you. There were times in the Old Testament where where the people of Israel messed up, and he says, I can't even speak to you. If I speak to you, I'm going to kill you. God takes worship very, very seriously. And after those 400 years, complete silence, no prophets, no new revelation, no new books that are in our Bible today, the next time he speaks is out of the mouth of Jesus. The next time he speaks, Jesus has come to earth to die for the sins of not just Israel, but for the entire world. You see how things have changed between Malachi and Matthew? God basically says, listen, if you're not going to worship me, I will find faithful worshipers somewhere else. That's the exact same thing that Jesus says to the, the Samaritan woman, the woman at the well, when he's going through Samaria. She comes to him and she says, Jesus, I've heard that like we're supposed to worship you over at this mountain, and some people say we're supposed to worship you uh, in Jerusalem. What's the deal? Where am I supposed to worship? And Jesus says, woman, here's the thing. There is a day coming and has come. It is, it is here now, that day, when you will neither worship me in that mountain or here in Jerusalem, but true worshipers will worship me in spirit and in truth. He says, it's not about a location, and it's definitely not going to be landlocked to Jerusalem because they had about a 1,000 years of opportunities to do this right. And God's plan had always been to redeem the entire world, but uh, Israel kind of ushered that in by saying, hey, we're we're not going to worship you perfectly. And so God makes it very, very clear. He does not need our worship. He invites us to worship. You see the difference? God is not this like insecure God who's like, tell me I'm good. Tell me I'm great. I need to hear it one more time. God doesn't need our worship. He was perfectly fine before the creation of the universe. He was in perfect fellowship, God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, before you were even a thought, before you had been spoken into existence. God doesn't need us. He invites us in to worship because he knows this about us. We were created for worship. Every single one of us worships something. You might worship your phone, you might worship a relationship, you might worship the future, you might worship money or success, but every single one of us worships. Here in Malachi, in the book of Malachi, God has a problem with the quality of their worship. And I know this sounds kind of backwards to us, because um, most of you guys grew up in the same kind of Christian church era that I did, the same kind of church culture that I did, and we hear all these kind of things sayings and church slogans and sometimes worship songs that teach us wrong, unbiblical ideas about worship. And we don't notice it. And we say things like, we've probably said it here, hey, you can belong before you believe. You get what that means? We said to people, hey, if you're here for the first time, it's okay, you can belong before you believe. And that is true, and especially if you're here tonight. Like, what we're trying to say is that there is value for you here, even if you're not a follower of Jesus. But at some point, I don't, I'm not trying to hide this. It is our agenda that you one day believe, that one day you get saved. You accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior because he's the best thing that's ever happened to us. Would somebody say amen? Yeah. I'm not trying to hide it. I think it's more manipulative and even dishonest for me to try to trick you into becoming a Christian. But that's why we invited you here. That's, that's what this is about. And so uh, it's a little bit misleading. Yes, you can belong before you believe, but at what point are you going to start worshiping Jesus like he's the Savior of the world? At what point are you going to start honoring him like he is the creator of the universe and the king seated on a throne, right? And so especially if you're a follower of Jesus, like this is, there's a time when you've got, to, you've got to change that. Then there's a song that came out in the 90s that I think really introduced a new idea. Some of you guys are old enough or your parents are old enough to know this song. It was, Come, Now is the Time to Worship. You guys know the song? Okay, a song, it's, 
It Sounds Good. That song was a bop. It was like 1998. I Actually, me and Clint watched a little clip from that worship video, and it was like the worship pastor, most cringy thing I've ever seen. The man goes, come, now is the time to worship. I'm not even exaggerating. Clint, is that exactly how it went? If you thought that was uncomfortable, imagine like a 45-year-old man who's bald and he's got a, a, a guitar hanging over his belly. Like, it was more uncomfortable, I'm telling you. But one of the lyrics of that song, it got really popular, believe it or not. One of the lyrics of that song was, come, just as you are to worship. Come, just as you are before our God. And, and that's so s- simple, and it sounds great. You're like, yeah, just as you are. You don't got to clean yourself up to get to God. That's true, but you do have to clean yourself up to offer acceptable worship to God. And some of you don't want to hear that. That sounds uh, legalistic. It sounds elitist. It sounds like we're trying to keep people out of heaven. We're trying to tell people that they're not good enough. No, that's not it at all. But what we see here in Malachi is that God accepts your repentance just as you are, but he does not accept your worship just as you are. I'm going to say that one more time. He accepts your repentance just as you are, but he does not accept your worship just as you are. You don't have to clean yourself up to be good enough to get to God, to ask for forgiveness, to begin a relationship. But once you're a follower of Jesus, there is a standard, and that standard is your very best. He doesn't say, hey, listen, you didn't spend enough money on me. Hey, I want more gold in the offering plate. He doesn't say anything like that. Look at what he says in verse 12. He says, you profane it by saying that the Lord's table is detestable and the food is contemptible. It's another idea of saying like, hey, you could care less about it. You hate it. You despise this offering. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, lame, or diseased animals and offer them sacrifices, should I accept that from your hands? No. No. Because you can do better. Because you have better, but you're withholding it. Cursed is the cheat. He says this person is a cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock and vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I'm a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. Now, why did I take us to this passage? A, because it impacted me and it challenged me. And I think there are a lot of times when I don't give my very best, when I'm distracted, I'm like, oh, i got to preach in a minute, Lord. Help me to preach good. Help me to not make any mistakes. And God says, hey, you're, you're supposed to be worshiping me right now. So it, it challenged me. But in, in a lot of ways, I'm, I'm very thankful for this group. I love this group, and I'm proud of this group. Because more often than not, this group is characterized by a passionate love for Jesus and a very real, sincere worship. And I I can't read your mind. I can't know what's in your heart. But for the most part, from the outward expression that I see, you guys love Jesus and you show it. I've seen you worship, and and it's the real deal. Um, But I want to push that other five, maybe 10% of us in the room who are saying, Zach, I don't know if I'm comfortable worshiping in front of others. Zach, I don't know how to worship Zach, I like to worship quietly in my heart. I don't want others to see me. I don't want it to be a show. I understand that there is a place for some humility, but at some point it drifts so far that it's actually pride. And now we're just thinking about ourselves. We're just thinking about the way that we look and what other people are thinking about us. And so uh, I understand that some of you guys are saying, Zach, I worship on the inside. It's just between me and God, and I pray the words quietly in my heart. That's fine, but that's not worship. That is not corporate worship. And you can say, like, hey, that, that, that sounds like a quiet time. That sounds like a personal prayer time. That sounds like a special time between you and the Lord that I think you should have at home, in a prayer closet, or in your bedroom when you wake up or before you go to sleep. Maybe as you're singing in the car. But corporate worship is an outward expression. The original Hebrew and Greek words uh, literally translated as prostrate, which meant to lie face down on the ground and kiss the feet of the person that you were worshiping, right? How many of you guys want to lie face down on the floor tonight for worship? I don't think we have to do it exactly that way. I don't think that it translates to our culture. Maybe it does in some certain moments in some certain times. But what we are, what is inescapably clear about the entirety of the Bible's language about worship is that it is a physical expression, You should not be able to worship without me being able to tell. 
I, I know some people uh, who are who are followers of Islam, and I can tell when they're worshiping, and they're not embarrassed when they get out their uh, the carpet and they and they bow towards Mecca. But there's a lot of pop people who are standing in the middle of a church around people who, for the most part, agree with them and are on the same team and say, hey, like we also are worshiping Jesus, but they're like, I don't want anybody to know. I'm going to put my hands in my pockets. I'm going to mumble the words, and God knows what's in my heart. Well, if what's on the outside is an expression of what's in your heart, you're not worshiping. You're a very good actor if you're worshiping. I want to just give you seven expressions of worship that we see in the Psalms. I'm going to fly through these because we're short on time. One thing that we see in Psalm 47 is that we're actually commanded and instructed sometimes to clap. Clapping is an expression of worship. Psalm 47 verse 1 says, Clap your hands, all you nations. Shout to God with cries of joy. In Psalm 27 verse 6, we see that shouting is something we're supposed to do. Not only clapping, but shouting. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his tabernacle, I will, sa- I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. We're supposed to clap, shout, and we're supposed to sing. In chapter 47, verse 6, he says, sing praises to God. Sing praises to our king. Sing praises. We're supposed to dance. How many of y'all know we're supposed to dance sometimes? Somebody said, no, no, we're not. It's a little different in, in certain cultures, but we are instructed to dance. Psalm 149 verse 3 says, Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp. We're supposed to play instruments. Some of our guys are getting ready to play instruments in just a moment. Psalm 33 verse 2, chapter, yeah, verse 2 says, Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him with the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him. A lyre was like a harp. It's not like somebody who tells lies. Sing to him a new song and play skillfully. Shout for joy. Not only that, but sometimes... The psalmist instructed the the audience or the congregation to bow. Bowing was an appropriate response. In Psalm 95, verse 6, he said, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And then sometimes they lifted hands. They were told to lift hands. Psalm 63, verse 4 says, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Do you know what I don't see in any of the psalms? Mumbling. Talking to the person next to you about what you had for lunch that day or, or just picking at them or messing with them. I don't know. I don't know what it is you guys talk about, honestly. Standing like a statue. You know, worship is not just something in your heart. It's something that starts in your heart and spreads to your entire body. And people should be able to tell that you're worshiping. And then finally, this isn't scripture, this is just me. I personally believe that if you worship expressively, in spirit and in truth. If you do anything that sounds like what we see there in the Psalms, it's more fun. It's more fulfilling. It helps me focus sometimes. Because when I pull out my phone for just a second, I'm like, I'm just going to text so-and-so that the music is a little too loud. And then Instagram is right there. Oh, somebody tagged me. In the middle of a worship service, I confess. But I can confess that because I know I'm not the only one in the room. You know, um, You're not an individual worshiper. You're not an individual performer. This is corporate worship. Worship as a body of believers, and we're here for something bigger than ourselves. Um, Kendall is going to come and give us some instructions, but this is fun because we get to put this to practice like right now. And so I'm going to pray, and then Kendall is going to come and give us some instructions, and uh, we'll have a minute to stretch our legs before we get up here and worship Jesus. Uh, But bow your heads and close your eyes with me. Dear Heavenly Father, God, you're so good. We're so thankful for you. You are so worthy of our praise. God, we're going to discuss the message later, but I I pray that even right now we would be able to put this into practice. God, I pray that we would be able to exercise some of these expressions that you've gifted us with to worship you. Lord, I pray that you would um, use these voices. You'd be honored by the shouts and the singing that we offer up to you. We're so thankful for you. In your name we pray, amen.